Anna. Hey, morning, everybody. Good, Good morning. morning. We go. Okay. Here we go. Okay, get out. Oops. Let me get out of the way. Hey, was that, uh, is that really the Detroit Lions playing yesterday? <laughs> Something else. <laughs> well, you know, for once they hung on. You know, they'd had a lot of good leads and just couldn't quite hang in there. And this, they're seeming, they're learning. It's a learning curve. <laughs> Kathy, welcome back. Thank you. I actually saw Dave Zimmer there too. Oh, really? Yeah, How it was. A, it was a um, meet Congress breakfast at the Alzheimer's Association. So you were able to tell your stories and why you're involved with Alzheimer's. And so he was there with his wife. Oh, neat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hmm? I went to the uh, conference. The you have to get a new bag. Oh, there, uh, yeah. I, I can talk from right here. You know, these. So we use the rest of the bag there. Yeah. Yeah. Charlotte, I feel like I'm spying on you guys while you're having conversations. <laughs> <laughs> we need to turn our, turn our um, uh, audio off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought he was ready. Well, I mean, at least it wasn't anything bad. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh. Yeah. Hey, Ross, it's good to have you back. Mm -hmm. Let's see what. <clears throat> This is what I want gallery view so I can see who was there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Muted. Yeah. Actually, not yet. <laughs> I'll give folks a couple more minutes here. <clears throat> Mm 
Marge, you made it. <laughs> Good morning. Yes, I did. I'm a little late, but I, I definitely made it and I got your message. Thank you again. Good. Good. Hey, how do you know how to make the luminaries? <laughs> I don't have to do that anymore. Mine were just delivered to my door. <laughs> Our neighborhood still does it every Christmas Eve. Really? Mm-hmm. How nice. Mary, I think you got the sound all messed up. Okay. Um, we've got a good group here. <clears throat> Who would like to open us in prayer today? Would like to do that. I'll do it, John. Thank you, Swid. Let us pray. Gracious God, at this, the beginning of the Advent season, it is wonderful to gather together to study your word, to find this time of quiet, to reflect upon your love for us, your blessing upon each of us. As we study your word, help us to remember the meaning of the season, that we may reflect upon it every day and rejoice in the gift of Christmas morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so chapter 12, <laughs> what questions do you guys have? Kathy, and then Swift. So this might be a weird question, but when Mary wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, was that, a, was that a normal practice or was that just a great sign of respect to do it that way? I'll just say, yeah, it was a great sign of respect. That would not have been the traditional way to, <clears throat> to do it. Me. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Swid. I love being able to study books chapter by chapter and i'm always amazed at at things that catch my attention and i was particularly drawn by the reference to judas iscariot and the kind of person that he was which you know was not surprising but to know that that he had been a thief and that he kept the common purse and steal and stole from it and i was wondering i don't recall when was judas called to be a disciple or how, how did that come about? You know, I, I've i never thought to ask myself that question. I'm sure someone can Google it online, but I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't remember him. I, I don't remember that. I mean, I remember him being in the list. Yes. You know, but I don't remember a specific call like Peter and Andrew and, you know, and some of the others. And it's, um, it's interesting how, you know, his question seems to be, you know, so, so righteous, you know, and, you know, and taking care of the poor. And yet, you know, he has, he has stolen money that could be used for them. Right. And actually, I want us to, I'm going to want us to think about that description of him when we get there. Um, anyway. I'll, let me just say that. So just hold on to that about Judas when we when we get there. Yes, Brian. Yes, uh, I'm curious about the Greeks. Uh, what was the Greeks? What were they? They wanted to speak to Jesus. <clears throat> should, 
Jesus said it's not his time to be glorified. Yeah. Is it because they're uh, more secular or outside the Jewish community? Well, I don't yeah. understand why he wouldn't, what they wanted from him, I guess, and why he wouldn't talk to him. Right. And um, yeah, it's that whole that uh, that whole conversation is a bit odd, but it's very Johannine. OK, and, and we'll we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about the, <clears throat> the, the Greeks, because there's at least two ways people can understand or have understood who they are. OK. okay? Um, Yes, Paul. Yeah, in, in verse 10, the, the priest made plans to kill Lazarus. Is, is Lazarus mentioned past this, this chapter? Any place? Um, no, because we shift, we're going to shift focus completely. This is a transitional chapter. Okay. And, and starting in chapter 13, um we're gonna we're gonna shift this is the this is the transition from the book of signs to the book of glory and and so i don't think i can i can tell you here real quickly if this is the end of uh lazarus's him being a part of this just a second <coughs> see yep no he disappears after this chapter um yep he disappears after this chapter this is it this is the last time he's mentioned What else? Yeah, Paul, go ahead. So in 25, yeah. it, it, there seems to be a really, really stark warning there. If the man who loves his life, he loses it. <coughs> the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternity. Yeah. yeah I don't see yeah. that passage at all. <laughs> what? Well, I don't know. It doesn't, it, this, it doesn't make sense to me. The person who well, I understand the person who loves himself may be lost. Maybe they're conceited, but if he hates himself and end up safe, I don't understand that. <laughs> okay, then we will talk about it. We'll make sure we do. Um, let's see. Love, hate, life. Okay. What else? Yeah, Mary. Um, I'm continually struck by the structure of this gospel. Okay. Um, and you say here, this is the, um, the transitional chapter to the book mm -hmm. of glory. And this chapter in and of itself is very highly structured. Um, is this typical for the time? I mean, if I were to write this and have a highly structured book and you know i'm now on part two and i'm thinking boy i'm getting really tired of writing and rewriting to get it the way i want i can't imagine well one i imagine this is a very learned person writing this but two where did this idea of all the structure and the um the setup come from I don't think it seems normal. No, it is not normal. It is not usual. This is an extraordinarily different kind of book <clears throat> from, I think, almost anything written in this day or time. This is truly a theological manuscript um, where the stories have been shaped and formed by a desire to tell a theological um, yeah, to make some theological points uh, about Jesus and about the community. So let's say this is a book of the 20th century or whatever century we're in, I don't know. Um, and I sent it off to my publisher. 
is this one of those books that would likely end up on the floor because, you know, who would read it? Or is it so engrossing that it would be on the bestseller list? Uh, you'd have to add, okay, so I'm gonna take a poll here. Um, just raise your hand. How many of you think it would end up on the cutting floor written as it is now? Couldn't hear that, you broke up. Oh, sorry. How many of you think this would be left on the cutting room floor? Um, if it was written today. Uh, oh, if it was written today, yes. Yes, if it was written today, sent to a publisher today. Oh, it depends on who the publisher is and what kind of literature they write. <laughs> well, this is true. There are different kinds of publishers. Um, I, it, it's, very, it's a very confusing book. But, you know, there are all sorts of confusing books out there. If you've ever read Slaughterhouse-Five by Vonnegut, you know, people get lost in Vonnegut. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, but, it, but it's, well, it's a book that would not be easily understood because we don't live in the, in the first century. Mm -hmm. and, and so many of these images and metaphors and ideas are are tied to Judaism in the first century. You know what's going on in the temple. What uh, what are the temple rituals? Uh, you know all of the I am the light. I am all of that is is tied to what's going on at the Jewish festivals in the Jewish temple. And so if you didn't understand that, it 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 makes it very hard to really wrap your head around everything in here. So in a sense, yes, it's a, it's a very odd kind of book. Bobby. Maybe the question is, would it end up on the publisher's floor? Maybe the question is, how popular would it be to the general population who would read it? And I think it's got a very targeted audience. I, I know a million people who would never pick it up on their own, but if it was like a guided situation, or an assignment or something, right. people would read it. Yeah, Swift. Well, I can't remember when this was written, but it's certainly after Christ's death and resurrection. And um, in as I'm looking at this, um, John is recounting what, what took place, Christ's words, Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the section on the unbelief of the people, which, you know, certainly occurred. So I, I would think it would be, it would be interesting to people of that latter period of time after the resurrection. Right. It, you know, the, the issue is today. And, and what I find interesting is that um, the Gideons, you know, your Gideon Bible that you find in the, mm -hmm you know, in the motels, the hotels, they have tracks, you know, that they hand out. And they're John and the Psalms. And, or some Psalms, not all the Psalms. But, but I have to say, I've always found it fascinating that they give you the Gospel of John in the King James. And King James is hard enough to read as it is. And, and being someone who knows nothing about Jesus or the Bible, trying to read through the Gospel of John. Um, you know, I, I've always just found that sort of an interesting dynamic of the Gideons. Um, you know, Luke would have been a whole lot easier to read, I think, than John. But, but I think they think there's some important things, like John 3.16. Um, so what other questions? before we, Swid. On that section on the unbelief of the people, this would be verses 37 through 43. Um, you know, at the big, at 37, um, you know, people, there were people that did not believe them and, and left. And of course, then there are the references to from Isaiah. And then I thought it was interesting in 41 or 42 that even 
despite the unbelief of that was evident, there were authorities that believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it for fear they'd be put out of the synagogue. They loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. I'll tell you, that struck me as present today. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's always social pressure, right? I mean, there's, it's always been there, always will be there. Um, you want to fit in. You don't want to lose your friends, your job, your relationships. Mm -hmm. Swid, continue. I was also intrigued by verse 46 and 47. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. Right. I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Um, what confuses me there is <laughs> what he means by, I mean, I love yeah. that statement. I do not judge anyone who hears and does not keep them. What does that mean from Jesus' viewpoint? right especially in verse 48 when he says the one who rejects me and does not oh, receive yes. my word has a judge yes and that is god right uh and on the last day the word that i've spoken okay but we'll talk about that because that's an interesting um an interesting way for him to couch that okay anyone else all right, let's let's jump into the chapter. All right, so now six days before Passover, okay, um, Jesus has not gone all the way to Jerusalem yet, um, but where does he go? Bethany. Right, and who lives in Bethany? Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Right. Now, quick question, how many times do we hear in, 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 the, in the first part or half of this chapter that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Um, A lot. <laughs> times, at least twice. Well, well, it isn't talked about here. Just the one. Not just once, not just twice. Three times? Three times. So uh, first is in, um, is in the first verse. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Then you get it again in verse nine, when the great crowd of Jews learned he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And then you get it again in verse 17. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. Why, why do you suppose... We get this three times where he, he identifies him specifically as the one he raised from the dead. I'm not sure there's any specifically right answer. There may be more than one answer. But why do you think? What 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 would what comes to your mind? First thing is Christ's own resurrection. Okay. On the third day. Right. Yeah, Brian. This may be the most significant sign in the book of John, I would think, uh, raising someone from the dead. So I think they just want to make sure that, that, that this is totally understood and by different audiences. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Bobby. Plus, the number three is, is always very important biblically. Yes, three is important. <laughs> And became even more important because, again, that's how long Christ was in the grave. Right. Yeah, Mike. 
<clears throat> I want to say there might be some connection to the Trinity, but I can't substantiate that. Uh, possibly, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet. <laughs> I think we're we're focusing here on on the whole idea of resurrection. So, you know, and one of the things to to remember is that in first century Judaism, resurrection was never intended to be a uh, solitary event for one person. Resurrection was always for the whole people. And, and we get a, a sense of that at the end of Revelation, for those of you who took my Revelation class, uh, when, when all of the dead are raised. Um, actually, there are two resurrections in, in Revelation. The first is those who believe in Jesus, and the second is everybody else. Um, they're all resurrected. So this idea of an individual resurrection is going to play a significant part at the end of John, right? To say, okay, you'd been warned, you know, there's this foreshadowing <laughs> that someone can be raised from the dead. And so, you know, and so don't be surprised at the end of the book when Jesus gets raised from the dead. Don't, don't, don't let it shock you. Okay, so we get this bit about um, Mary and Martha. What do you, um, anyway, what, 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 what strikes you about that story? I see Mary and Martha, I mean, they're doing their usual thing. You know, dear Mary, you know, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's spending quality time with him. And Martha's there in the kitchen, quietly going about doing her work, preparing a wonderful dinner. And that's, I mean, both of them are showing their own type of love. And yet, <laughs> I, I think of Martha often, you know, when you are busy preparing a dinner, something that's always bothers me is not spending enough time with my guests. Yep. And, and, and I'm sure Martha probably felt that way too. And she seems to be doing this all by herself. There's no help. Yes, that, that may be so. Absolutely. Brian. Yeah, well, Jesus is only 31, 32 years old, roughly in that range. And here she is buying it for his burial. That's a big foreshadowing of why would someone, be 30, you know, I mean, the average life expects maybe 50 or something, but but it's a foreshadowing sure of his death again in this gospel be coming soon. And I would think. Right. Remember, if this chapter is all about foreshadowing what's ahead. Right. You know, you get the, the Lazarus image foreshadowing resurrection. You get the pouring of the ointment foreshadowing of his death and, and burial. Um, you know, it's kind of like, hey, everybody, look, here's, here's, what's, here's what's coming. Um, and and then you get Judas Iscariot. What do you all make of Judas Iscariot? He doesn't belong there. <laughs> He's a scoundrel. I think, right. Judas, I think Judas gets a bad rap personally. <laughs> because because some, no, because someone, I mean, all the all the disciples failed Jesus in the end. I mean, they all, you know, were with them. They all failed. Jesus, you know, I mean, Judas the bad guy because he betrays jesus but we probably betray jesus ourselves a lot of times through our own life i think and i so i i'm not that i'm glorifying judas but i just think uh uh we always want to point to him but if we reflect on ourselves how many times do we betray our faith or jesus i i you know that's kind of my okay. take on him it's right. easy to dump on him it's easy to dump on judas but if we do it 
internal examination, we may be closer to Judas than we think. Right. <laughs> yes. Roxanne. Tweet us if you want. He had a, something up. He was there for a purpose to betray Jesus. Right. So that he went to the cross. Right. Somebody's got to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Mary. Um, am I now muted? Yeah. Okay. So I find it interesting. They say he's in charge of their money. He says he's in charge of the purse, but but he it it also appears to be known that he's uh, pretty lenient in what he takes out of the purse for himself. So that's kind of interesting that nobody's uh, making him <laughs> stand up for his own issues there. <laughs> well, yeah, they need it. They need an annual audit, right? Yeah. Um, they need a, a, a CPA firm to come in and, and audit the purse. Paul. I think, I think every so story needs a, a villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there are several villains in this story. But I want, us, I want us to think about the description of Judas as a metaphor. <laughs> I think we, we jump right to the immediate thing of saying, oh, he's a thief, he's blah, 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 blah. But, okay, <clears throat> he was a thief, kept the common person used to steal. Where have we heard about people who, um, who are thieves and robbers and steal before in this gospel? Tax collectors in here or no? No. Okay. Okay. Let's. Um, I should have. I should have um, circled it. Do you remember when Jesus is saying that he is the good shepherd? Mm -hmm. How are the bad shepherds described? They only come to rob and steal, and they all run away. That's Jesus' description of the bad shepherd. And so what we have in Judas is the physical demonstration of the bad shepherd. Because the disciples are all supposed to be shepherds, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they are the ones who ultimately shepherd the sheep. And, and what Jesus is sort of saying here is that even in the midst of all the good shepherds, um, there are bad shepherds. And so as much as this is a historical reminiscence of Judas, and I'm not saying it's not, what I'm saying is that I think in the Gospel of John, it's, he, he uses that same language from a bad shepherd to describe Judas, and Judas is going to run away and betray him. Okay. Yeah, he, and so, knew about, he knew about, I mean, he knew that he was stealing. Right. He was aware of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he knew the whole thing. He knew what was going to happen. He, said he knew who was going to do it and what they were going to do. Right. He didn't make it easy, though. So, all right. So thinking about that, um, what do you all make of verse 8? Which, Marcy, is... You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Well, he's talking about the time when he will not be there anymore. He's going to be gone. He's going to talking about his death and resurrection. But right. Strictly the death. Yes, it's a reference um, to his death that he won't always be there. But what do you make about the the poor will always be with you? Well, if you're good, Brian. shepherd, you take care of them. 
Right. Okay. Okay. Brian. Yeah, I think that is, you know the world's never going to be perfect. We're not only are we always going to have poor, we'll probably always have wars, we'll always probably have discrimination of all these things. But so Jesus is saying, you know, recognize me here, but that's your job. <laughs> you know, so they're always going to be with you, but as a reminder that that's, you know, putting the onus on them, even when they were accusing her of, uh, uh, quick to accuse her of buying, uh, Mary buying the uh, perfume to anoint Jesus, uh, they were faulting her, but what are they doing in, you know, in their own life? You know, it's easy to pass that blame on other people. So I think that's what the reminder is that uh, it's not a perfect world. It will never be a perfect world until until the kingdom comes and it's our job to to keep working at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Others. There so, won't always be the light. Pardon? There won't always be the light that, that Jesus is the light that shines in the world right now. Right. And, and he's there to set an example and something horrible is going to happen and earth shattering is going to happen within the next few days and he's um so jesus won't be with them anymore to guide mm -hmm. them right yeah and that's absolutely what's being said here um what what i've always found disturbing about this passage is not the passage it's the use of the passage I've heard lots of Christians say, well, look, we don't have to do anything about the poor. Jesus said the poor will always be with us. So we don't need to do anything. You know, we can just use our money as we want. We can do whatever we want. And we don't have to worry about these people because they'll always be here. And, that, um, and that's the opposite. We're supposed to, if you were shepherds, we have to take care of the people, uh, others, the the sheep that we have to take care of people <laughs> amen marcy that'll preach so wrong <laughs> right it's it's it, yeah it's taking it out of context he's saying right now you know this is what's needed in the future i think going with what brian was saying what's going to be needed is spending it on the poor and helping those in need he didn't say don't help the poor. He just said in this moment, mm -hmm. in this moment. Well, I mean, Bobby. Jesus was helping when he was alive, was helping the poor in spirit, the poor in all many different ways. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of saying that um, when he's no longer there to do this, then the people need to take over. Mm -hmm. Two thumbs up. I agree. I agree. And and but as I said, people have have manipulated it to say just the opposite. But I agree, Bobby, hundred percent. All right. So now he's he's talked about resurrection. He's being prepared for his burial. Um, and then you get this um, nine through eleven. Uh, the crowds learned that he was there, but they came to see Lazarus as well. Mm -hmm. And Lazarus is really the, as someone said earlier, I don't remember who, that that was sort of the greatest sign. But it's also the, the last sign. It's the last of the great signs, right? Everything sort of builds. It, it builds to that place where um, we see resurrection as a possibility. That Jesus has the power over life and death. Um, and now, look at, notice the, is there anything in those three verses? The language, um, it's interesting language in verse 11. Since it was on account of him, meaning Lazarus, that many of the Jews were, mine has deserting and were believing in Jesus. D do you anyone have something other than deserting? I am going away. Going, going away. away. Okay, Mary, you're muted. Oh, 
Going over. Going over, pulling away. Um, what is that? And, and, uh, and oh, there we go. All right, Mary, you're up. You're good. Uh, mine just says going over to Jesus. In other words, they were kind of converting to Jesus. Right. Um, yeah, they're 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 coming over. They're coming over. They're going over. Mm -hmm. They're deserting. What what does that imply, though? What does that imply? It's saying that they're leaving somewhere else. <laughs> they're, right, they're leaving, leaving to go someplace else. They're, I Swift. mean, they're leaving oh. the following of the, of the uh, traditional, oh. the Pharisees and stuff. Right. Yeah. Swid. Well, it's, um, I, to me, I see it as a reference to the chief priests losing their power. Because they're out to get Lazarus. Mm -hmm. It was on account of both Christ and what happened to Lazarus that the chief priest wanted to put him to death. Mm -hmm. And they also want to get rid of Jesus, too. Yes. Yeah. So there's really, there's a lot wrapped up in this these short verses. So if you think about Deserting, going over. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> college football, uh, something that never used to be possible. They, they, it's called the transfer <clears throat> portal. That now any any player who wants to leave their college can just leave and go someplace else. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be you were locked in by a scholarship for all four years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and now you have people constantly moving from one team to the other team, and um, and uh, baseball free agency didn't used to be free agency it used to be locked in. Um, but what you have, if you think about it, what that says is there are two teams. Mm -hmm. There's very clearly two sides that Jesus and the Jewish leaders or Jesus, if you will, and Judaism are, are two different entities and that one has to choose which team you're going to be on. Are you going to be on Torah team, you know, the law, or are you going to be on Jesus team? You know, at the beginning of John, remember, uh, Moses brought the law and Jesus brought grace and truth. Okay. So um, now see in the, in the other gospels that's not the case you know jesus is a good teacher of torah he's a good rabbi but in the gospel of john it's two teams and you have to choose which team you're going to be on and and essentially it is it is people deserting one team and going over to the other team brian i think the number of people on the team was the only the only concern was on the pharisee side that that these people, because they were losing power, like Swid said, I think mm -hmm. Jesus, if they were coming over just because they saw this man raised from the dead. <clears throat> that wasn't gratifying to Jesus that they were on his team because of that sign, because he knows when things get tough, you know. Uh, so Jesus would be more, are we getting the message? Are we understanding what we're called to do? They all came over like, you know, a freak show at the circus. People always wanted to go see. Lazarus was basically a freak in a way because this is the only man supposedly raised from the dead. Come look at him, and you know, and believe or not. So I, I kind of think that Jesus wasn't too concerned that these people were flocking to him if it was for that reason. Uh, but the Pharisees sure were because of the loss of power, like Swid said. Right, and so we yes, and and so I think in some ways yes, Lazarus was kind of a sideshow. And so if you get rid of the sideshow, then no one will come to see Jesus. Um, and, 
and so what's what's fascinating to me about the gospel of john is you have some people believing and others not believing but then some people believing but not admitting they believed and some people who believe but then maybe they really didn't believe um they believe but jesus hasn't been glorified so they can't really believe you know there there there's just this kind of mushiness to me for lack of a better word about believing right now in the and and we'll see it we'll see this played out even almost to the very end of the gospel of john is is there's just kind of this mush of of what it means to believe or not believe um anyway and, and we'll see more of that all right so what happens next the entry into jerusalem right. the triumphant entry and uh, what does everyone proclaim hosanna Hosanna. Blessed Why? Is Israel. I'm sorry, say that again, Dana. Blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is the king, as you said. Right? So this is the proclamation of the people that Jesus is king. Okay? And so it would certainly seem like somebody understood, sort of. But what do we get in verse 16? <laughs> they remembered what was written. Right, but at first, they didn't, they didn't understand. Right, they, they didn't get it. You know, they, they, you know, this is, and, and that's what I meant about this mushiness, is here are these disciples who were following him, and you would think believed in him, but they don't understand anything about this declaration of being his being king, even though the people are all waving their palm branches and 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 proclaiming it. It it, it it's like somehow they're they're not in darkness, but they're not in full light either, right? That that it's kind of <laughs> dusky. They were um, anticipating a different kind of king. Yes, yeah, possibly so political king could be a political king right which is certainly what the authorities thought um also named be why the pharisees were freaking out because they didn't want to get quote in trouble unquote they didn't want right. to rock them that much right all right so now verse 17 What's important about what you think about verse 17? And let me read that to you, Marcy. Um, so the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out from the tomb, raised him from the dead and continued to testify. Well, they're associating him with Lazarus, and they're putting great stock in this. And this is part of the hallelujah coming into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Pharisees are, they're getting worried now. Right. They're eyewitnesses. Right. And then, <laughs> and actually, it's if we follow with 18, it was also because they, meaning the crowd, heard that he had performed this sign. That the crowd went to meet him. Right? Well, and then they, they decided they're going to get rid of Lazarus, too. Right, right. They made that decision funny, to try I and do that. Before. It's funny, I've read it, but I never saw it. Before. It's like, oh my word. Well, that's the wonderful thing about rereading the Bible, is you, is you find all sorts of things you've never uh, thought about or sort of locked yeah. onto before. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, ju just on uh, me though, if I saw someone raise somebody from the dead, I'd like to follow that person too, because what happens when I die? Maybe he could raise me or my family members. 
but not realizing that the other signs Jesus did is what actually could give you eternal life by following Jesus. So I think they're totally misguided by that, obviously. And I think I would be too. If I put myself in their position, why wouldn't I want to follow this person? What's the other king ever done for me? He couldn't raise anybody from the dead. So I think, and that's why it fades off real quick. You know, they got on well, Sunday, but then it doesn't last long. But but I think, you know, again, I think we're kind of hard on the people, but boy, I would follow that person if just for that that reason. Right. And and so, yes, as you say, then, what's the problem with people following him because he showed a sign of raising from someone from the dead? They only partially understand. Right. As Brian said, yes, they're following him as a miracle worker. So the next guy who shows up. They're going to follow him they'll follow him too, right? And, and so if following is only based on a sign and not inherently on who Jesus is, they're yes. not following him because he's the light and the word and the good shepherd. They're following him because of something they've, they've seen with their eyes. They, they haven't heard the parable of the rich man. You know, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom? They may change their mind when they hear that parable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Jesus says some things that don't always make us want to go, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, sign me up to lose my life. Um, okay, so then um, 19 Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look. And who's gone after him? The whole world. Yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole world. <laughs> Again, let's think about foreshadowing. We foreshadowed his resurrection. We have foreshadowed um, his death by, by um, you know, M Mary wiping his feet. Now we're foreshadowing the expansion of the gospel into the whole world. Okay. And, and, and out of the mouths of babes, <laughs> you know, out of the mouths of those who would kill him and, and we're going to encourage the Roman government to kill him come this world that we can do nothing. See, think about that. Jesus is in charge, right? That's the, that's one of those big themes of John. Jesus is in charge of everything. And so, they can do nothing, right? Because he's in charge of everything because he's God, word made flesh. And now because of that, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to go to the whole world. The whole world is going to follow it. Expansion of the, of the church. So again, foreshadowing. All right. Um, now this thing about the Greeks this is this is one of those sort of odd moments where you have this these people come to Jesus and Jesus says nothing at all that has to do with anything that they're asking for right so um, now Greeks here can mean two things it can mean Greek Jews maybe three things well probably one of two things either it's greek jews because remember after the babylonian exile the judaism had spread all around the empire uh, there were jews in egypt there were jews in rome there were jews all throughout the empire and so these is could mean greek speaking jews okay rather than hebraic speaking jews or aramaic speaking jews Okay, so that's one thing it could mean. The other thing it could mean would be God-fearers. And a God-fearer is a Gentile who believes in, um, in, in Yahweh, in the God of Israel. So it, it could be either of those two things, and it's not clear which it is. 
John, is there a clue? Because yeah. they go to Philip and they they say where Philip was from uh, in, Gal in Galilee, but was a bit. Is, is, so is that a clue as to why they went to him? Because he was related to whatever their thing was, you know, if they were Jew, Jews or. I, I think it's because he spoke Greek, that he came okay. from a, a city where Greek was perhaps the langu okay. lingua franca. That, that makes great sense then. Okay. Right. And so they know that, that Jesus, the other disciples wouldn't understand it because they speak Aramaic and, and they speak Greek. So it's not clear whether it's, again, Greek-speaking Jews or uh, Greek God-fearers, Greek-speaking God-fearers. But what's the point? Regardless of, uh, and this is a very Old Testament kind of idea, what's, why does this matter? What do, what do they ask to do? Think metaphor here, Jesus. folks. We would like to see Joseph. We would like to <laughs> see, see Jesus, right? Right. Think about what that means. If 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 Jesus is the light, okay, right, rather than the darkness, they they want to see. Meaning they 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 don't just want to visit with Jesus. They want to understand who Jesus is. They they want to see the truth and the reality of Jesus. Hmm. Um, you know, because they could have said, oh, Jesus is just over there. See him? <laughs> That's not what's going on here. To see means to look deeply into someone. But who's not wanting to see Jesus? Yeah. Well, the Pharisees, they just want to... Right. <laughs> All of his enemies, they don't want to see him. They want to get rid of him. Uh -huh. Right? And so this is, again, what's, this is, again, where the, an outsider, right? Outsiders want to really see who Jesus is. Insiders do not. In, in the other Gospels, um, the disciples really don't understand who Jesus is. Who is it in the other Gospels who really understands who Jesus is? The Roman centurion that Mark does at the end. At, at the end, but who throughout the Gospel knows? Interest, this is one of those fascinating things. The demons! <laughs> oh. <laughs> the demons all recognize Jesus. They know who Jesus is. Uh, and in fact, in John, with the pig story, um, it was, and the demons recognized him and said, whoa, Jesus, don't, don't, you know, do away with us, send us into the pigs. Um, because they knew who he was. They could see that somehow the demons could see on a spiritual level what people on a physical level couldn't see. And, and so they want to go deeper. The, the Greeks, the outsiders. Which, by the way, if you think about it, if John's writing in ninety. Sorry, I'm, I'm processing this out loud now. When, when, is Paul, when does Paul write? That's before that. Yeah, before that. Yeah. Late 40s, 50s, early 60s. Okay. okay. Now, where is the church growing in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s? It's in Rome. Rome. It's Greece. growing all throughout Greece. the Gentile Greece. world. It's growing all throughout the Greek speaking world. Okay. And so, well, why is that? Why is it growing? Because Greeks say, we want to see Jesus. The Greeks want to know who Jesus is. And that's why the church is growing throughout the Greco-Roman Empire. It's not growing within Judaism because the Jews don't want to see Jesus. Would, would it, I see some very puzzled looks. <laughs> would, would we say what the what the Greeks want to do was when we say see recognize more? I mean, there's you know, 
meet him so they could hope to gain more to recognize or evaluate who he was. So we use that word C kind of uh, is, is interesting to use. Right, but it means they're open. Right, 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 right to, right, to hear, learning more, right. Right, which is why the church is growing. I'm gonna go to Bobby. Well, the, the Greeks have nothing to lose. Oh, they do. Oh, all right. I'm not Trust me, they, <laughs> they have a lot to lose. If they believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because if you, in the first century, second century, third century, if you believed in Jesus, you became an outcast. You became an enemy of the state. Because to be a good Roman was to worship the Roman gods, because the Roman gods are what kept Rome safe. And so when you quit worshiping the Roman gods, it meant you were a traitor to the culture. I was speaking of the Greeks, though. Were they in Rome? Well, uh, Greek speakers. In the Roman Empire, you had Greek speakers, you had Latin speakers, you had Aramaic speakers. And so this idea of the Greeks... They, they worship Roman gods, which were sometimes interchangeable with, with Greek gods. Um, they often just had different names, depending on where you were. But you go throughout what, what, is the, what would have been the Greek-speaking part of the Roman Empire, which is now Turkey, um, Syria, Egypt. Um, you're Greek. Roman citizens, and, and they had uh -huh. temples there to... Um, you know, and Paul talks about how difficult it is in places like Philippi, Ephesus, you know, struggling against um, this culture, this, this, Roman, this Roman culture. So actually, they had a lot to lose. Okay. Um, so. I figured they were from far away, like Greece somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> all, all everywhere. Okay. So now. We get this section, um, and Jesus answered, it's like, we want to see you. And so what is he? Um, and actually, in some ways, actually, this is kind of an answer. This next section, the hours come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, my father will honor. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. That is a jam-packed um, passage. I thought this picture was really, really, really cool. Yeah. Yes. So let's unpack it real quickly. Verse 24, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What is that foreshadowing? Two things. Resurrection. Resurrection and? Death and resurrection. Yep. And? And then the growth of the church. The church yes, yeah. the growth of the church. Right. So this, that one line brings together all that's come before it brings together the resurrection all the stuff about lazarus and it brings together all of the expansion of the church right so jesus is saying um, unless i die the church won't expand all right he's saying this to the greeks too i mean yeah he's saying this to the greeks he's not saying it to well the jews are there but he's right. saying it he's, he's saying you're you're going to be a part of the kingdom if you choose right. to yeah, that's, that's part of the inference there. And then the bit about those who love their life, lose it, those who hate their life in this world, keep it for eternal life. I would argue that all of that is referenced back to what I was saying uh, to Bobby's question. That to be a Christian in the first century was a dangerous thing. That's one part of it. Brian, looks like you're pondering on yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, the key word is in this world, hate your life in this world. So people that are oppressed under the Roman Empire, this is the downtrodden. They're, it's not that they hate their personal life, but they hate their life 
in the world that is so corrupt and evil in a way with sin that it's kind of like the least among us, you know, the least among us. And Jesus says, you know, a lot of times they will be, have everlasting life. So it's another way I think of rephrasing that in a way. Right. It's, it's, who are you willing to, who are you willing, what are you willing to do to follow? Right. Because if you love your life, essentially you're not loving Jesus. You know, and, and that's the struggle. Um, here. And remember, John is either or. Either you love your life or you love Jesus. One or the other. You know, there's can't no you, subtlety in the Gospel of John. Can't you do both? <laughs> you could, because I can do both, I feel, because I love what I'm doing. And I feel like I'm also serving Jesus and God. Yes. And, and, and I would argue the answer is yes, but in the gospel of John, it's one or the other, you know, and, and love here is means, see, and I would argue though, you could think of this as aligning one's life. What, who are you aligning your life to your words, your deeds, your actions? Are you aligning your life primarily to you or are you aligning your life primarily to Jesus? Okay. But, but again, this is, this is John. John is either or, black and white, clear delineation. The other Gospels are not really like that. That's just the Gospel of John. Um, and, and, and so, John, and, and the, by the way, this is also going to be in Revelation. You're going to see this same thing, you know, in, in Revelation. Um, all right. So now let's jump to 27. Um, now my soul is troubled and what should i say father save me from this hour no it's for this reason that i have come to this hour father glorify your name okay that's why i'm saying that this is the transition from the book of signs to the book of glory jesus asks god to glorify okay and and real quickly to the word glory in um in the old testament speaks of god's shekinah glory god's presence god's power god's power and presence being revealed to people god's glory was on mount sinai when god came and gave the law god's glory was there when God protected the people. So to talk about glory, it, it, and here it is, Father, make your presence known, seen, and revealed. Your presence, your power. That's that idea of, of glory, that it's this weightiness of, of the presence of God. Because obviously, up to this point, people are still trying to figure all this out because God's presence hasn't been fully revealed yet in Jesus. Okay? And, and so that's what Jesus is asking for. Now, what happens? Voice from heaven, thunder. Yeah. And, and what... Um, and what does it say? I've glorified it past tense. I will glorify it again, future tense. When did God glorify in the past tense? Go back to chapter one. In the beginning was the word. word and the word was with god was god and the word became flesh flesh and dwelt among us so the glory of god really came in jesus in the word so that's past tense future tense is we'll see in the resurrection okay all right um 
now the crowd says it's thunder and angels talking to him now we get to this bit about um 31 now the judgment of this were now now is the judge now think about this now is the judgment of this world not next week not when people <coughs> die not sometime in the future this is very johannine this is not this is not really tied in with much else in the new in the new testament but in john why has the judgment come now because of the attitude of the of the jewish um, people toward how you uh, follow god it it actually comes right down to the very beginning of the book when they when they uh you know the whole stuff that they do. right but what's you know in, in a sense this is this is john saying that the judgment comes in how one chooses to believe or not believe in jesus that's yeah. judgment judgment happens then judgment is not weighing the scales of someone's life because if you notice now the ruler of this world will be driven out why because mm -hmm. jesus will go to the cross and the glory of god will be revealed and and this is fascinating verse 32 <clears throat> and i when i am lifted up from the earth right resurrection crucifixion resurrection will draw all people or all things to myself you know that that has a very universalist ring to it doesn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to be your mind yep absolutely marcy <coughs> but then there's this interesting conversation that people say but wait the messiah never remains forever ah foreshadowing <laughs> you know he's going to die he's going to be raised but guess what he's always going to be around you know he's always going to be and we'll learn more about that we'll learn more about how that works um, in the okay. chapters to come. Are you okay. coming up? Yep. Um, and again, he talks about himself as the light. The light is with you a little longer uh, while you have the light. Let's see. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you're going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may. Uh, that's an interesting verse, 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, so you may become children of the light. Right? Now, how does how does Jesus say that in, in the other gospels? You are the light, light of, of the, world. the world. The world. Right? See, and, and this is and, and this is where john and and the other gospels tie in they just tell it differently right jesus tells his disciples you're the light of the world you are to demonstrate the light of how people are to walk and the direction they're to take and john says become children of the light because then you become light bearers out into the world so it's this image of us <laughs> being light bearers um, that matters all right um so now Jesus leaves them at the second part of 36. And then you get this thing. Well, you know, he's done all these signs, but they still don't believe. Right. So you have people who are walking in the light who believe people walking in the dark who are stumbling all over the place. Now. Um, and, and, and the reason and the reason they don't believe is because. God hasn't let them believe. You know, he blinded, verse 40, 
God has blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, so that they might not look with their eyes. See, again, the idea of seeing. They might not look with their eyes. They might not see. And understand with their hearts and turn. But, 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 but. And I will heal them. <clears throat> see, not all hope is gone. Here are all these people who can't see, who don't see, who don't believe. But the prophet says God will heal them. God will take the scales from their eyes and let them see. All right. Um, and people and, and and people have argued all over the place about verse 41. Isaiah said this because he saw his glory. What is that Jesus glory, God's glory, and spoke about him. We think it's Jesus. Well, I'm not sure how Isaiah saw the well, although if Isaiah saw the glory of God, think about Isaiah's call. In the year that King Uzziah died, I was in the temple and the glory of God, you know, showed up in the temple and God gave me something to do. Um, you know, and he's just, see, and it's so, it, he says, well, but people didn't believe, but now, well, even the authorities believe. Right, but because of the Pharisees, this is this fear of, and again, this is for this is foreshadowing, because many of the authorities uh, in the in the synagogues and elsewhere might believe in Jesus, but they are afraid to speak mm -hmm. because there's a price that'll be paid. They'll be cast out mm -hmm. of the synagogues, which means you lose family, you lose friendships, you lose business connections, you lose your whole community because all of that was tied in together. All right, now. Um, So then, again, Jesus, you know, and again, this is how, this is the themes of the gospel of John, right? The word became flesh and the word was God. The word became flesh, dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Then Jesus cried, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in the one who sent me. Okay, because if you believe in God, you'll believe in Jesus because Jesus is God. And whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. Again, this idea of seeing. The Greeks, they wanted to see, right? So if you see <coughs> Jesus, see God. Now I've come as light to the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness, right? So once again, we're back to this idea of light and dark. You know, the light came... Uh, Chapter one, the light came into the world. The darkness could not overcome it. We're, we're getting that repetition of that theme. Now, someone asked about this judging part. I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them. For I came not to judge the word world, but to save it. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as my judge. For I've not spoken on my own, but the Father has sent me himself and has given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know his commandments, eternal life. What I speak, therefore I speak just from the Father. So think about an image. This is almost one that you have to think about a visual image. Here's God. God has sent the Son into the world. God has sent the Son into the world with a message. The Son gives the message to the world, and those who believe the message then, and believe in Jesus then, believe in God. So what that does is that connects, you think, uh, see, I need a third hand, I need to, an octopus would be better, but, um, you know, th what this says is, is that to, to, to hear the message and believe and and to believe links one to Jesus, which links one to God. But if you don't, and if you don't believe the message, then you don't believe Jesus, then you don't believe God, and so you are not connected to God. And being connected to God through Jesus is what brings for John eternal life. You know, it's like 
it, it's it's like a power cord but if you don't have the power cord plugged in um the the power of god there there's no connection <coughs> Yeah, so, and, and so G, this, in some ways, this chapter sort of brings together all the great themes of John, right? It brings together signs, it brings together resurrection, it brings together light and darkness, it brings together why some people believe and others don't, it foreshadows the growth of the church, it, it reminds us and foreshadows that, that Jesus will always be with us. And so th this is just a really great sort of summary package of, of the gospel. Um, because next, next week, we'll, we'll jump into the, the book of um, glory, which, and 90% and, and of what follows is going to be all be in the upper room. That, that the book of glory is the upper room trial crucifixion resurrection okay that's the that's the book of glory because that's how jesus is going to be glorified is going to show god's very presence and and power in the world okay questions thoughts feel overwhelmed yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah All right. Who would like to close us in prayer this morning? I'd like to do that. Okay, Brian, thanks. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, as we pass through this Advent season, please quiet our hearts and minds from all the secular distractions that surround us so we may truly see and accept your gift of love, peace, forgiveness, and eternal life. And may this gift forever change us into your service by showing your love to others in need always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. All soon. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Bye. <laughs>